Uh, there he is. Hey guys. Hey, hey. Hey, Pete. Brandon's going to unmute you real quick. He's good. All right. You're good. Good evening, Pete. How's it going? Doing good. How are you? Good, good. That was a good one. Man, that was so good. I I guess a, lot, a lot for us to unpack. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know there were parts where I was like, I think he talked about this last week in the Zoom, but we're going to have to come back around to it again. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, uh, hey, Kate. Hey, uh, Brad. Hey, Dan. Uh, those are folks that I am not yet familiar with. Uh, different Dan. Sorry, Dan Patterson. Um, just introducing myself to those of you who are checking in for the first time. Uh, great to have you with us. You're not going to be unmuted yet. Um, we're gonna. I'm going to chat with Pete for a little bit, and if you're joining us, we are going to uh, open up the. Uh, open up the ability for you guys to unmute. I'll call you out in a little bit so we can do some Q&A. Um, but come on in right now. Um, we're going to give it a couple more minutes just to see who else jumps over with us. Uh, you are being recorded, by the way. I want you all to know that. Um, this video may be used for promotional materials. So that's uh, heads up. Hey, Joey. I know you can't say anything, but I see you there. Well, yeah, there he is. Hey, Chris. All right, so what are we at? 602, that's good enough. The rest of us can join. Oh yeah, hey, Grace, your dog is awesome and interested. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, man, Pete, um, in your mind, where do we want to start? We're, uh, we're um, I'm trying to think if there's anything like contextually, obviously the, uh, coronavirus in the election, but I'm trying to think if anything happened this week that serves as like a lens for where we take this conversation. Um, what's, uh, what, what do you feel like coming off of last week should be the sort of the starting point? Yeah, um, you know, and in some respects, yeah, this is a more general topic. Whenever uh, Ben and I first started to talk about this series, we started with an idea of doing something more dialed in to some kind of contemporary issues. Uh, and then as I kind of like did this kind of thought about it, it kind of became more general. Um, so if, if I can just do a, like a five minute context of what I'm trying to do, and then we could take it from there. Um, yeah. By the way, Ben told me afterwards that a few of you um, are psychotherapeutically trained. And so we were talking a little bit about psychoanalysis last week. Hopefully I didn't patronize any of you <laughs> when we talked about it. So it's really good to have some therapists in the, in the room. Um, okay, basically what I'm trying to do in all three of these sessions is, I mean, I'm not talking about Christianity or religion or faith in particular um, as a set of beliefs about the world, ourselves, uh, the origins of the world, anything like that. I'm picking some thinkers who are exploring the idea of a mode of being in the world. What does it mean to be in the world? Uh, what is the contemporary mood of being in the world? Uh, we might want to call that the kind of, uh, in terms of, because we live in the capitalist mood of production, you know, the capitalist mood of logic or, uh, you know, modern mood of logic, whatever you want to call it. So I'm asking this question of what is the Christian form of life? And you could say that we today um, uh, live in a type of what Hegel would call a bad infinity which means that we're always moving forward. We're always we're expanding out, looking for the next thing. Um, we have an, obviously an economic system that has to continually expand, but also we are continually always thinking about the future. Blaise Pascal once said that we find it hard to live in the present for two reasons. One is either our present is very painful, and so we don't want to live in the present. We want to fantasize a future that's better, or our present's great. It's really good and then we're scared because it's gonna it's gonna end if you're in love at the moment and it's going really well that's gonna that's gonna end at some point so we we don't like to think like that so you know we often tend to live into the future this is what hegel calls a bad infinity always moving to the future so that's one mode of life and there are religions sacred and secular that are always promising a future paradise a wholeness and completeness that lies in the future but then there are also religions of nihilism. There are ways in which we think that we can shut down our desire. That's the answer. Don't have any desire, right? Effectively. And that's the way to find peace. 
Now, Simone Weil uh, rejects both of these. And she is saying that faith, the life of faith, is a type of satisfied dissatisfaction, just like the miser. Like she has, she, she doesn't think the miser is a person to emulate, but she thinks that the miser here has, has stumbled upon an insight. Um, and in her book, Gravity and Grace, she uses that insight. And so I'll say one more thing, sorry, I know I can't talk too long, but in, in relation to this satisfied by your dissatisfaction, I'll use a concrete example of my work. So, and, and what Hegel would call a good infinity. So a bad infinity is something that goes on forever, right? One, two, three, right? Whole numbers go on forever, it never stops. If you live in a bad infinity, you're always looking to the future. You're always moving forward, trying to get something that will make you satisfied, right? Hegel contrasts that with a, with a closed infinity or a good infinity. And what he means by that is, um, one mathematician called these numbers transfinite. Between one and two, there are an infinite set of numbers. 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, right? So it's an infinity that is bounded by finitude. Now, what this means in practice is, in my work, I'm trying to define something called parotheology, right? Which is a theological and philosophical uh, theory and technology, right? So every time I try to define what that is, I always feel that I failed, right? And uh, there's a certain dissatisfaction, so I have to do another course or write another book, right? But um, each failure actually brings into being the very thing that I'm trying to express. So I'm trying to express it, but it doesn't really exist. It's just a word I made up. But every time I feel at, at saying what it is, it generates productivity and it generates something. And I'm satisfied by not articulating it. That, that struggle is actually where I find pleasure and depth and meaning in my life. So when Ben mentioned about how do we desire what we have, what Simone Weil would say is that you realize that what you have is full of infinity. Um, and actually, you know, I mentioned about the object of desire and the object cause of desire and talked about how these two need to be located in the same place. This is where you give yourself, for example, to a cause, a vocation, right? You give yourself to say psychotherapy or whatever it is, that's your vocation. And you'll never end at becoming better at it and developing your thinking and becoming better in the clinic, et cetera, et cetera. And, the, and your failure is actually what generates your depth and experience of meaning. That, and that's what Simone Weil talks about as the a form of faith. And, and one thing, I'm sorry, is that this is a protest, this is a counter-cultural mode of being. If you have, if, if the church is not necessarily a place about belief, but is about creating subjects through liturgical enactment that are freed from this bad infinity of always being dissatisfied, always frenetically pursuing wholeness and satisfaction beyond. If, if, the, if it's a counter-cultural collective in which people are able to embrace their dissatisfaction and enjoy the struggle of life and find meaning in that, that's actually a mode of life that is better for the world, better for individuals, better for the community, and that is a political act. Oh, wow. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, you've got six weeks to process that. Um, <laughs> So Pete, um, bring bring this home. Sort of what I'm what I'm some of what I'm hearing and thinking. Um, and this, I guess, my task is to continue to bring this back to to this community and sort of our practice. Uh, one of the things that I keep hearing is is um, both the presence of and the practice of a humility that is always acknowledging uh, what it doesn't have, even though it practices with conviction. I feel like I heard you say that. And I, I like, I do like the way, you know, we use the language here of a school of love. And I, I like that it's the tension both of, of committing to a way of enrolling in a school and owning that we are students. And that by showing up to the school, we're always saying we don't have it yet. Like you said, with a therapist or any vocation that, that we have enough conviction to show up and, and enough humility to know we're nowhere close is that is that somewhere you're talking about so i guess some something about humility go, go there yes <clears throat> yeah and um <clears throat> you're it's you're hitting the nail on the head but we have to be very precise because 
what I'm saying is, is different from what you'll hear in some, actually in many churches, you'll hear this, even conservative churches, which is, of course, that we don't know everything, right? There's a episte what's called epistemological humility, which yeah. is the idea that, hey, we don't know everything. There's more to learn. And when it comes to the absolute, then we're always by nature going to, to have a, a sense of a lack of knowledge. Now, by the way, that's great. And there's a truth to that, right? There's a basic truth that we can always learn more. But that's not what I'm saying. Um, I, what I'm talking about is what's called an ontological humility. And in a nutshell, this is what I talked about last week with, with Paul Tillich. See, people think Paul Tillich is all about doubt. And I'm all about doubt, right? It's all about doubting and questioning. But actually, for Paul Tillich, there is a certainty that arises when you go as deeply into doubt as you can. When you go into unknowing at the deepest level, you discover something that is indubitable. You discover that, that in the humility and the unknowing, a type of knowing. Now, I'll use, I'll use an analogy very quickly as in science, it used to be that there's the world of what is known and then there's the world of what is unknown. So there's what we know and there's what we don't know. And what we don't know, we can continue to expand the, the, the field of scientific knowledge. But with modern science, unknowing becomes integrated into the field of knowledge, right? So now the idea of wave particle duality is a type of unknowing that doesn't come from a lack of knowledge, but actually from a, a highly sophisticated mathematical set of for formulas. So unknowing is integrated into knowing or take love. If you're, if you're lonely and you're single and you, you, you can't love a person that you don't know, you just love the idea of being in love, right? But then you meet somebody, you can love that person and you can love that person because there's some sense in which the unknowing is in the knowing. When you know someone, you know that you don't know them. You know that there's always more of them to, to know. So it's not that you don't know someone because you haven't met them. You don't know someone precisely because you have met them. <laughs> and the more you get to know them, the more you don't know them, right? The more of an enigma they become. And of course, theologically speaking, with Karl Barth, he says, it's not that there's the known world and then God is unknown. The whole idea is that God is the name for an unknown that is incarnated in the known, right? The unknown doesn't become known, but the unknown dwells within the known. In psychoanalysis, that's called the unconscious, right? Anyway, so what was the question? Yeah, uh, I forget. I, it doesn't matter because that okay. was the right answer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, I, 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 I remember that from your early work. I think the idea, uh, the idea that the infatuation of being in love is is inherently an expression of dissatisfaction. It's like an it's like an addict. Who is who's really hard up for a hit it's a sense that you'll never have enough of getting to know yes yeah. there's a satisfaction <laughs> satisfaction yeah oh and by the way yeah i remember the question and just just to just to bring it to the question as you're saying that, that it's not simply then like oh we can be open to unknowing and we don't know things right. this is actually much more this is very hardcore this is actually saying that we come to know that we don't know um right so you know in that bible verse it says we know in parts and then we shall know fully, right? There is a veil and a veil will be ripped away and then we will know as we are known, right? So the conservative reading of that, that verse is that the canon of scripture is when the veil is lifted, right? So a conservative theologian will tend to say, with the revelation of Christ through the canon of scripture, we know the truth. And then a liberal will tend to say, well, we don't until the afterlife, the next life with the veil will be relieved, you revealed and then we'll know everything. But a radical way of reading it, when this sounds weird at first, is that it says we know in part and we see in part. And th but then when the veil is torn, we will know fully, right? What will we know? It doesn't say. What I want to argue is what we will know fully is we will know fully that we do not know. When you don't have a, you, when you don't know fully, you fantasize that there is a fullness to know. It's precisely the lack of knowledge that generates the fantasy of a wholeness and completeness. In the temple curtain ripping, right? You see inside the Holy of Holies and you realize there's nothing there. There's nothing in the sacred. There's nothing in the space that will make you whole and complete. So the, 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 the knowledge is we enter into the space of, we know that the universe itself is, 
has a type of indeterminacy built into its heart. And when we experience that in our being, we're broken from the frenetic pursuit of wholeness and completeness. And here's the irony. We feel more whole and complete in giving up the pursuit of that. Yeah. Yeah, I had a, I had a, a handful of conversations in the last seven days in which I did some of the things that are the most painful things I can possibly do which is to admit failure and admit that there are things that I can't do. Uh, and I feel better than I have in years <laughs> um, because there is, yeah, there, there's absolutely uh, a freedom in that. And I want to, you know, I, I'm sitting here and I want to, I'm going to get to your guys' questions. I just want to, I'm going to spin Pete up real quick and let him talk for a few more minutes and then we'll, then we'll get to it. Um, I'm sitting here thinking, kind of coming back to tonight, this idea of living between having and not having. Um, I want to come back to kind of where you open. So let's say from, uh, you know, from an economic perspective, we, we live in a world that says, uh, you know, have money. Um, from a healthcare perspective, we live in a world that says have health, um, you know, get it, possess it. Uh, from a, you know, for a religious or church perspective, have the truth or whatever. I'm wondering what, um, in practical terms, what, what does it look like for us to live, to your point, in a, in a society that prizes um, consuming our way to enlightenment, uh, to talk about living well in this tension of having and not having, um, I guess in terms, and like politics, you know, is about having power. So I'm wondering how this works with, with real examples where, you know, the, the, the function of the economic system is built on getting money and the function of the political system is, is built on getting power and religious system is built on getting whatever it is, truth or salvation. Um, so what does this look like in practical terms in a community to, to find this sort of sweet spot, to find that tension where we're not just being lazy and saying, oh, we don't care about knowing it because we never will. And we don't sort of regress to uh, conservative certainty where we say, well, we don't need to look anymore because we've just got it. Um, what does yeah. that look like politically, economically, you know, in, in our community? Yeah, no, this is exactly so. I, I would say that, um, and by the way, a book that I think is very good on this, I think Todd McGowan is one of the, the kind of best writers and thinkers in terms of um, these ideas, psychoanalysis and uh, political economy and these theological ideas. Uh, his book, Capitalism and Desire, is very, very good. So in, in a nutshell, you know, capitalism, as we know, is premised on expansion. So it, it is a kind of a always expanding. That's the idea. It kind of contradicts the, you know, the second law of third dynamics, entropy. Um, uh, but the alternative then is some sort of hard limit where we try to kind of like check out and kind of uh, you know, have no kind of like frenetic um, energy that creates change and, and technology, et cetera, et cetera. This is why I'm talking about Simone Weil and relating it to this idea of the true infinity or good infinity, is that this is about a type of, it's, it's not about not, it's not about being uh, constantly moving forward into the future and being dissatisfied in the present. And it's not about trying to get rid of your desire. It is a form of acknowledging where true satisfaction is. So in psychoanalysis, an analyst will generally try to encourage the, their analyze and to ask themselves, what pleasure are they getting out of their displeasure, right? What satisfaction are they getting out of their dissatisfaction, out of their dissatisfying relationship? What, 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 what wish is going on in their dream or whatever, right? Um, they're imagining their, their, their brother dying horribly in their dream and they're, they're horrified by this dream. You might kind of go, well, is there any satisfaction that's coming out of it? You know, it is your dream after all, you know? So um, a lot of what I'm talking about is we don't realize where true meaning and depth is. We're always avoiding it through this frenetic pursuit. The type of life that I'm talking about is one, just like I talked about my work, where I can never articulate, I'll, I'll die having not articulated what this project is. But that constant dissatisfaction and struggle in doing it both creates a body of work and creates a meaningful type of existence. So it is productive. It's funnily enough, a very productive mode of being, but it also frees you from this frenetic, um, dissatisfying satisfaction. 
that, that. Yeah, beautiful. I, I, yeah, absolutely. I got it. I think the, uh, the, the things that I keep thinking of, you know, we, we, I'm coming back to the school of love, but that's one of the things, that especially David and I have talked a lot about is sort of the language of graduation and that this is a unique school because it's one you don't ever intend to graduate from. You're sort of always acknowledging you're not ever going to have it. You're not ever going to know it, but you continue to enroll. And I think a bunch of my friends from recovery are in here too. And I think the same thing, you get to the 12th step, you don't invent 13. You, you, you keep doing the same thing. You re-enroll and you acknowledge you're not done, that there's always space to work the program, but you have a program. You know, you have enough conviction that you've done something. And if I, if I could just mention very, very quickly, like there's, I'm talking about, there's, you could say there's three types of unknowing, right? There's what you don't know because you haven't read enough, right? And you can learn. There's also unknowing, unknowing, things that you know, but you don't know that you know, things that you hide from yourself, that you don't open the doctor's letter because you know it's going to be terrible. You don't look at your bank balance. You, um, this is the type of analytic unknowing, which is we hide from ourselves what we know um, in order to avoid a confrontation with it. But then there's an unknowing that comes from an excess of reflection and a lifetime of reading and reflection, an unknowing in which you realize that that unknowing is built into, into the blueprint of reality itself. And I just, so I kind of mentioned those three types of unknowing. Awesome. Uh, great transition. Okay, we've got, let's say, maybe 10 or 15 minutes left. So I'm going to open it up. If you guys would, just raise your hand and I'll ask Brandon to unmute you and then you can, uh, you can chat with Pete. As I expected, we got it all. Oh, David Malinowski. <laughs> hey, Pete. Hey, David. Um, so when you talked earlier about uh, the, the object of desire and the object cause of desire, so this is a loaded one, okay? In terms of today's politics, how are, how are both sides uh, living that out? Aha. Uh -huh. That's interesting. That's very good. Damn. Um, yeah. Um, so in terms of, um, well, oh, I mean, <laughs> this is a, you know, that whenever, whenever the Democrat, whenever Trump won initially, there was a sign that Democrats would hold up that I always find fascinating. It said, "Love Trump's hate." Love Trump's hate. I always thought find that so fascinating because, of course, it's such a beautiful double meaning, right? So the, the surface meaning is love is better than hate, and we think Trump's hate for whatever. But of course, the the uh, the unconscious reading is we love Trump's hate. In other words, you know, we're getting something out of our dislike. We are unified uh, by our shared hatred of an enemy. And um, so I do see, unfortunately, on all sides, um, a kind of, I, I think of it in terms of hypochondria, is if, if someone has cancer, and, right, two people have cancer. One's a hypochondriac and thinks they've got cancer and one isn't, right? So the hypochondriac thinks they've got cancer and then they find out they have. And they're like, oh, brilliant, I was right. right? They're almost glad they have it they've got their, because they've got their generalized anxiety into their cancer. And annoyingly, they're libidinally invested in their cancer, so they're less likely to really want it to, to end it. Whereas if someone's not a hypochondriac and has cancer, they're not libidinally invested in it. And so they're, they're, they can more easily to make the right decisions to, to maybe try and get rid of it. So I do see on all sides scapegoat mechanisms. And I do see, I do see the kind of annoyingly, like you, you start to need the very thing that you're attacking. Can mm -hmm. I say one other thing? But here's my, here's my controversial theory. So, you know, <laughs> my controversial theory is that um, the, 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 the America lives in two incommensurable worlds at the moment, pretty much. And on one side, the existential crisis is, um, is seen as uh, disorder and chaos. And on the other, the existential crisis is too much order and kind of totalitarianism. So one side sees, um, uh, you know, like they, they, so if I say it like this, you've got the extremes, right? You've got some people on one side who think that, uh, the, the liberal elites all are Satanists um, and there's loads of pedophiles and sex trafficking, right? And on the other side, it's uh, the, the, the major organs of the state are run by neo-Nazis. Each side doesn't see the other side. Like each side sees it. it was like, yeah, of course. So one side is basically saying the other side is hedonistic 
and completely kind of em embracing a type of chaos uh, and kind of like uh, trying to undermine Western civilization. And so whenever someone says to them, well, there's some fascists in your group, they might go, yeah, of course, there's a few rotten apples, but it's not systemic. And on the other side, they're going, oh, yeah, there might be some people who love chaos and just want to riot and destroy things. But that's, not, that's a few bad apples. That's not a systemic. And so what I think, and, and then what happens, of course, and you know, it's like, I think you do psychotherapy or you're a psychotherapist, maybe I'm not sure, but, but is that what someone represses returns. So what you find in, in the side that really believes in law and order, you'll find the eruption of pure hedonism and disorder, right? And on the side that is kind of embracing a more chaotic, you'll find the return of the repressed in, in militaristic kind of purity cultures. And, and so anyway, what I see is um, uh, incommensurable worlds at the moment. And uh, it's very, very scary. <laughs> To put it mildly, thanks. Yeah. Great question, David. That was that was really really good. I get I I, I appreciate the way um, sort of the frame of asking. I think, and I'm I'm trying to remember exactly the way you put it, Pete. But the idea that uh, the division in our political process is evidence of this, you know, of the the uh, the presence of not at oneness. Like that that's sort of the the uh, sort of the conflict is the the site of unity. Um, in, in kind of a sick sense, at least. Um, yeah. All right, any other? Yeah, Bill, uh, Bill Brennan. You good? Go for it, Bill. Yeah, hi, Pete. Good to see you again. and remember you from a couple of years ago down in Tampa. All right, good to see you, man. You're a hard guy to forget. <laughs> I can't tell if you said forget or figure out, but both. <laughs> hard, I said you're a hard guy to forget. Oh, right. Oh, well, that's nice. I like that. <laughs> um, you reminded me of a book called The Cloud of Unknowing from the Middle Ages. Um, an experience of uh, meditation called Centering Prayer came out of it. But it's basically all about now and not yet. You can experience that love of God or uh, now, but there's always more. And it's satisfying now, but it's just enough not to be satisfying that you want more. Yeah. It's like having a potato chip. Goofy analogy, but it makes the point. You can enjoy it now, but there's always a desire for more. And you're okay with that. Mm -hmm. I like that a lot. That's a great, I'm going to use that with my kids. Yeah. The, the, the experience of God is a potato chip, not a bag of potato. Yeah. Chips. It creates a desire without satisfying it. I accomplished that one time. I was at the Vaughn's house. We were at a, a barbecue. I had, I told my wife, I'm going to have one. It's the only time in my life I ever succeeded. <laughs> so it's possible. The Vaughn serves serve such good food. It didn't make a difference. Yeah. Well, my sister, I, I, I always hated my sister because whenever it was Easter and I would get an Easter egg, I would eat it straight away, but she could make it last for five years. She could like take a little bit and then wrap it, put it out, put it back in the fridge, nibble at it two days later. And um, what she realized that I didn't realize was actually the enjoyment of the Easter egg was in a, in a sense, um, not consuming it. <laughs> um, whereas I was the dumb person who thought that the pleasure was in the consumption. Um, but you're right, th th there's a link, a very, very important link between the apophatic tradition, between the cloud of unknowing and things like the dark night of the soul, um, the medieval thinkers like Anselm, and then some of the stuff that I'm talking about, they they're all revolving around lack, around a not having. In fact, this is almost the definition of the difference between, there's two types of philosophy, analytic philosophy, continental philosophy. And, um, analytic philosophy tends to think, tends to want to talk about what is, right? And continental philosophy tends to be obsessed by what isn't, by the nothing. And at first that sounds ridiculous. And that's why I love analytic philosophers, hate continental philosophers. It sounds, how can you talk about nothing? But actually nothing is one of the most uh, interesting uh, subjects you could ever talk about. I mean, mathematics, as soon as we put a, a, a circle around nothing, we created zero. Zero is uh, was a very big development within mathematics, right? So, um, you know, the, the nothing, uh, again, the unconscious as a type of 
rupture in consciousness again is a type of nothing that's very productive so um what what the early mystics the, the tradition that you're talking about they were the first to systematically intelligently reflect on a type of non-being a type of lack and its productivity and that tradition has carried on and it's developed and it's changed but it's but it's in continuity with exactly what you're saying you just you just reminded me i'm a psychotherapist i have a patient who gave me a gift and she said, I know you're not allowed to receive gifts. I said, yes, yeah, so why are you giving me a gift? She says, because this is an ethically appropriate gift. So I opened the gift and it's a round plastic ball, clear. And it was absolutely nothing in the plastic ball. It was clear. It was brilliant. perfect. <laughs> that was is brilliant. So <laughs> That's fantastic. That's per what a perfect gift. <laughs> hey, uh, and I, I don't want to give this away for free, but we should definitely talk to Clark, and you need to make that one of your little uh, one of your little things that goes out with another card, Pete. Send people. Oh, that's <laughs> right. We, we once once an icon because we, we always give gifts at icon every every event, and one of them was it was like this is old days. It was a tape or it was a CD, and it was called the Voice of God. And we said if you listen to this you will hear the voice of God. And of course it was blank, right? It was just an R. <laughs> <laughs> that is great. I saw Dan have a sound up there. Yeah. Yeah, Dan. Oh, uh, Dan, hold on just a second. Yep. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, there you go. Okay, great. Hey Pete, uh, yeah. admire your work. Uh, met you a few times. I'm pastor in Seattle, Death of God theologian. Uh, really appreciative of this talk, and thanks, Ben, for making this available on Facebook and the Radical Theology Forum. That's really great that you did. Good to be here. Uh, this is a question not meant to throw you. It's going to sound that way, but it's not, because I think there may be something behind this, and that is, I've heard you quote Schopenhauer several times, and my translation is different than yours. My translation says, has him say, the twin poles of human existence are want and boredom, Whereas I think I keep hearing you say pain and boredom. Yes. And what, I, what I'm wondering is if you could tease out uh, the significance of that difference between want and pain and why, you're, why you prefer to use pain in this equation. Time out. Yeah, no, that's good. I mean, I, 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 just a second, Pete. I just want to just to inject a shout out if anybody wonders what collective is and why we do it, because I can't preach the question that Dan just asked to Pete. Yeah. This is the only way to do this work. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, Dan, uh, my very good friend, uh, Jay Baker, is about to move to Seattle. Um, so I have to uh, connect him with your your community out there. So um, yeah. what's the, what are you involved in? Uh, Queen Anne Lutheran Church uh, is the community. We were hoping to get you before the pandemic to come up to Seattle with working with a few others. You and I talked about that briefly. I uh, used to be a professor before that at Seattle University and uh, did the, the book on death of God theology with Mike yeah. Sabarsky. Yeah, yeah so, no, I remember you and remember the books, very, very good. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I'll connect, I'll connect Jay with you. Please um, do. Yeah. So yeah, on that, I mean, that's me being a uh, non-academic. I would like to say oh, I, did, I did my own translation of that. Um, but <laughs> over the years of remembering, um, I, I say P and however, in the context of, of the quote um, and the piece, I think it's in continuity with, what's, uh, with what Schopenhauer is talking about, kind of want as in a type of painful longing mm -hmm. that you know, Schopenhauer wants to, kind of with his more Buddhist leanings, wants to, mm -hmm. wants to kneel down. So um, although it's a mistake on my part, uh, I think that the, you know, want and that pain is uh is in continuity with kind of my broader and yeah. reading of schopenhauer would you agree with that because uh, you'd probably you know i would yeah i would i like that and i think that your your point about him being in conversation with buddhism and and the whole notion of craving uh i think makes sense so it would be it'd be interesting as an academic exercise to go back and see what word he uses in german uh, and yeah. if in fact in the german it has that wider semantic range but i but the way you're using it makes good sense to me. I appreciate it. I, what, what I hope is retroactively, I'm proved right, and then I can pretend that I would use a more accurate <laughs> German expression. <laughs> so yeah, so uh, yeah, I'll put Dan forward to write the uh, to write the forward to that book. You guys yeah, can write it together. <laughs> sure. 
So I'm wondering, Pete, if this has, if the, I, I love this connection to Buddhism and, and obviously the, uh, I'm wondering if there's um, a connection in Christianity in um, the sort of uh, the idea of being empty or like the self emptying. I wonder if there's, you know, sort of the acknowledgement that um, in want or in desire is sort of the attachment to things being other than as they are. Um, and that there's also sort of a contentment in learning to uh, to be satisfied with things as they are. And I'm wondering, uh, I'm wondering if that's maybe a, a Buddhist articulation of, of sort of the place that you're inviting us to be, um, is to acknowledge that we have desire for things to be different and to choose to accept that we don't get to make them different all the time and that we sort of live in that, that inability to have and to have at the same time. Yeah, so th this is kind of gets down to like, really I think a fascinating uh, uh, part of this debate and discussion because there is a slight difference. I am not say, you know, so at least a westernized Buddhism would maybe say like a type of contentment, a type of uh, uh, reduction of your desire as much as possible, whatever, right? Actually, what, what I'm more influenced by psychoanalytic tradition and existentialism and and German idealism, so this philosophical tradition. And the slight difference would be that actually I'm saying that it's not that you want that you want to lower your desire or get rid of your desire. Because I actually want to say that all the best things come from desire or or what I want to call drive. Drive, which is is the overvaluing of things. And that's what love is. You overvalue something. And when I say overvalue, like you'll live or die for it. You, you, don't, you don't think of it in utilitarian terms. There's something that you'll go, what, what Kant calls the categorical imperative. It's like something enters into our life that we say that is worth me dying for and living for. Even if we don't, <laughs> even if we uh, a full never live up to the categorical imperative and arguably none of us ever do we still feel overcome by it so what i'm arguing using the work of lacan is that actually it's not about contentment actually this is where our contemporary world is very right okay so the reason why our contemporary form of consumerism is so powerful if it didn't give us satisfaction we'd stop Right? If this type of frenetic pursuit of more and more gave us no satisfaction, we would walk away from it. It's giving us something profoundly satisfying. We just aren't satisfied by our satisfaction. We don't see the enjoyment. We're like the kid waiting for the Christmas present and we are wetting ourselves. We're having a temper tantrum. We think that all the pleasure is in getting the Christmas present. The kid hasn't figured out that actually all the pleasure is in the waiting, right? They, they haven't been able to enjoy their enjoyment. So. This is where this is where I, I make a big deal of the notion of the forgiveness of sin, right? And I don't know if we talked about this last week, but if you if you think of the word sin as debt and debt as lack, right? So there is uh, an original sin just simply means an original lack. We experience a sense of lack. We're always trying to fill the lack, right? And debt is a lack. If I am in debt, it's not just I have no money. I have a lack of money that is given me heart disease, that's given me a job that I despise, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if someone comes along and they pay the debts, they fill the lack, right? So they, the, the lack that's there, they fill it with money and the lack no longer exists. But if someone comes along and they forgive a debt, they don't pay the debt, they don't fill the lack, they render the nothing nothing. So the, they render the nothingness that is something into a nothingness that is nothing. So all of that is, is means they, they rob lack of its sting, which means what I'm kind of saying is that, no, we, we engage in the struggle of life and love and loss of love and all of the painful parts of life, and we throw ourselves into it again and again, but we can do it in a way in which it's robbed of its sting, and it's robbed of its sting precisely because we're not fantasizing that there is one thing that would fix it all. Right? So we kind of go like, no, the, the enjoyment is in the roller coaster ride itself. That's a little bit different from what I would say, at least kind of some forms of Buddhism that I know, 
are saying. However, I'm open to being wrong because, you know, I'm no, I, I, by the way, I think there's forms of Buddhism that do it. I think Zen Buddhism, for example, is a good example. But I would say Western religions tend to be religions of hedonism, which say we can satisfy your desire. And Eastern religions tend towards religions of nihilism that say we'll get rid of your desire. And a religion of the absurd is this notion of uh, you enjoying your desire. And I think both Eastern and Western religions have elements of the absurd. So it's not that I'm throwing anyone completely under the bus. <laughs> Being into the mystics of each one, it kind of aligns more with the absurd. Okay. Did well, you by the way, while, while, while just before Ben says, uh, Dan's book, if anybody's interested in this stuff and radical theology, is Resurrecting the Death of God. And um, it's a great book to get your hands on. So I wanted to give that a shout out. So Ben, over to you, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I know, for sure. Um, let me, I'm just gonna type that in the chat. Uh, actually, Dan, would you type that in the chat just so we got the title if people wanna check it out? Be great. Um, uh, Andrew was, I don't think you could hear him, but Andrew was saying that in the, in uh, that if you look at the, maybe if you look at the mystical traditions of each sort of East and West, they may be coming closer to some of, you know, some of what we're talking about. Um, I wanna come back, I gotta go and, 10 minutes to pick up kids, but I want to come back to, uh, I guess, a very practical conclusion um, that I'll, I'll just say is built around my own self-sabotage. I mean, I guess hearing, in some sense, hearing this, part of my realization, and this has been <laughs> uh, through therapy, through spiritual direction, through recovery, um, all of this stuff is the realization that I probably have what I need and know what I need to know to be really, really happy. And the thing that I must enjoy more is the object cause of desire preventing me from having what I already have. And I'm wondering if I'm where I'm supposed to be or is there another step that's supposed to make this feel better? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, you're touching on something very, very key. Um, this is the nature of sacrifice and the role of sacrifice in meaning. Um, we have the, you know, the desire to, you know, get rid of sacrifice to uh, to avoid it, but actually, sacrifice is what gives meaning. Um, we almost think that we love, we, we we sacrifice to someone who we love, but very often we sacrifice, and in sacrificing we start to love. We sacrifice ourselves to love. Um, an example I have is, uh, you know, yeah, having a kid is such a massive sacrifice. So, you know, of course, whenever the child is born, it actually gives you a good kickstart into love because of the amount of sacrifice that, you know, and the amount of love. So in some ways, sometimes self-sabotage is exactly what you're saying. It's, it's a way of frantically attempting to bring meaning back into life through reinscribing loss back into existence. Uh, uh, Todd McGowan talks about how it, at the level of consciousness, that's the level of wanting stuff, wanting to succeed, wanting to have things. But the unconscious is the level of loss. It's the level of kind of like revolving around missing something. And because it's unconscious, we never see it. So we're always in the what's called will to power. We're always wanting stuff. We always want to succeed. We want to do well. That's our consciousness. But in order to maintain meaning in our lives, sometimes if we're neurotic, you know, we, we, will, we will sabotage. And the sabotage is actually what often generates the meaning. Like in the talk that I gave, the woman, Jill, she, her desire is, is fueled precisely by the threat of something being taken away. We often think that people are jealous because they love, when very often you find that people love because they're jealous that if you take away their jealousy, they no longer love, right? The, the jealousy is the way to maintain their love. So, um, but the big key is kind of somehow integrating that and finding your enjoyment in, so as it doesn't, so it basically if, it, if you don't find a healthy way of having sacrifice in your life, you, it'll come out in an unhealthy way. And traditionally religion was a healthy way of having sacrifice built into existence. Whereas in the contemporary world, sacrifice is everywhere in terms of the kids that make our phones and our clothes and the sacrifice of workers not getting paid. Now, sacrifice is everywhere in an unhealthy way because I don't think we've integrated sacrifice in a healthy way. Oh, wow. We probably have time for 
another question, but I don't think we have to. <laughs> Any more last hands? I think let's save it. We got another week of this. And then uh, hopefully by next week, I'm going to have a chat with Pete this week. And, uh, and we're going to talk about this won't be something through Facebook at all. But we may do a we may do a, a three week kind of discussion group webinar sort of thing that that Pete can lead on zoom uh, at some point. Um, so if we can work that out, we'll get the details up by next week. But uh, we definitely have next week, we got a chat after the uh, after the service. Thank you guys. Uh, if you've got more, which I know you will, um, definitely feel free to uh, to shoot me emails if you want to get questions or uh, if you want to jump on the Facebook. And, and just so you've got it documented somewhere, we can jump back in next week, write it down. Um, David, your hand was up? No, you're good. Okay. Uh, appreciate you guys a ton. Uh, we will see you all next week at five. Grace and peace. Can't hear anyone, so it's awesome. <laughs> see you, Pete. <laughs>